All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jana Hexter. I'm with the Northeastern IPM Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Pesticides in the IPM Toolbox uh, webinar today, uh, March 30th of 2022. And if you could advance the slide, please. Uh, there is going to be a recording of uh, the webinar today. I've had a lot of people ask me if there's going to be a copy of the recording. So if you know someone in that boat, anyone who has registered will receive an email from us um, probably early next week with a copy of the recording. And um, it will also be posted on our website at that address. But if you're here, you're listening to this, uh, it will be sent to you um, early next week. Next slide. And we welcome your questions. Um, so uh, it's hard for us to uh, keep track of the chat. We have over 68 people on um, at the moment and I'm popping up every moment. So um, it's very hard for us to monitor our questions in the chat that way. So what we ask you to do is if you scroll on your sc screen, you'll see the Zoom toolbar and there's a button in there with it says Q&A and like two little speech boxes. If you click on there, um, it will bring up a window and you can put your questions into that and it will help me monitor them. So if, if three people have the same question, I'll be able to tell and, um, and I can consolidate them because uh, we do expect to have lots of questions today. Uh, next slide, please. I'm delighted to uh, welcome our two pre presenters today. So Mary Simtrella is the de uh, Director of the Pesticide Management and Education Program. She was lucky enough to grow up in, the, in wild Wyoming, just south of Grand Teton in Yellowstone National Parks, where she developed a fierce love for conservation, ecology, and nature. She earned a PhD at Cornell University, where she studied the factors impacting mason bee health in uh, New York apple orchards. Having developed an interest in pesticide safety education through her research on pollinator protection, Mary has a unique perspective on pesticide safety and education and is looking forward to talking with you today about pesticides as tools in the IPM toolbox. Dan Whitstead is the Extension Support Specialist at the Pesticide Management Education Program. Um, he's been a pesticide safety educator for over 30 years, first in Wisconsin, um, and, uh, and since 2002 in New York. In addition to developing pesticide applicator certification training manuals and exams and being a resource to the public, Dan puts uh, together an annual workshop on pesticide on pest management in food facilities and provides information and outreach support to Cornell researchers investigating the environmental fate and health effects of glyphosate as well as pesticide effects on pollinators. So welcome both Dan and Mary. It's a delight to have you here today. And uh, given the registrations, I can see lots of people have, uh, have uh, an interest in this topic. And I've seen the presentation, it looks great. So, um, so next slide, please. We have some questions for you, um, just to have a gauge for us of who is uh, on the webinar and the kind of uh, um, experience that you have so far. So if you could post the poll for us, please. It should pop up on your screen. There it is. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes um, to, uh, to enter your responses. There are four questions and um, there's no right or wrong answer. Just if you don't know, just take a wild guess. This is, this is not school. <laughs> and I'll be quiet while you do that. All right, and I will share the results with you. All right, so as you can see, um, which of the follow following is a pesticide? And we'll go over that in the presentation. Um, in implementing an IPM, uh, an IPM plan, pesticides can be useful. And uh, there are the responses to that question. The likelihood that a pesticide will cause harm is called hazard risk or exposure. There's our responses to that at the moment. And the best way to determine which pesticide to use um, the overall majority of people suggested read the product label. No one said ask a staff at the hardware store. I think I might have done that on occasion. So, <laughs> um, all right. Um, and uh, with that, I will ask our presenters to, uh, to share with you and we will we'll stop for some questions. 
um, in about five, six minutes. And uh, we'll be, there's a couple of spaces in this presentation throughout uh, for asking questions. So next slide, please. Hi, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Yana, and thank you for the invitation to speak. And thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about pesticides in the IPM toolbox. And first I'm going to introduce our program. So next slide. So I'm the director for Cornell's Pesticide Management Education Program, or PMEP. You may have heard of PMEP. Uh, our program consists of two subunits. We have the Pesticide Sales and Use Reporting Group, or PSER. And that group is contracted by the Department of Environmental Conservation in New York State to collect and organize the pesticide sales and use data that pesticide retailers and commercial applicators must submit each year. Next slide. And then the second subunit is the Pesticide Safety Education Program. Uh, and so we changed our name recently to incorporate that word safety. Uh, next slide. Because that better reflects what we do. So um, the Cornell Cooperative Extension Pesticide Safety Education Program, or CCE PSEP, is designated by New York State to provide pesticide safety educations to all New Yorkers. And our mission is to provide objective science-based information about pesticides and promote sound decision-making and proper handling practices by people who choose to use pesticides. Next slide. So we do this by developing applicator training manuals. Next. Providing live and online training. Next. Uh, publishing crop and pest management guidelines. Next slide. And also just answering any questions uh, from anyone about pesticides. And so today we'll be talking about pesticides as part of the IPM toolbox. And just to make sure that we start off on the same page, I want to clarify the terms pest and pesticide. Next slide. So people often think that pest just means insects, but actually a pest is any living thing that has an undesirable impact on something that's important to us. Next slide. So while some you know, insects are pests or weeds or plant pathogens, uh, we also have rodents, disease causing bacteria and viruses. Next slide. And so that means that a pesticide is more than uh, just something that controls insects. You know, it can be something like an insecticide or herbicide which control insects or weeds. I think we're used to hearing about those. But it can also include things like disinfectants and sanitizers, which might control something like the COVID-19 virus, for instance. Um, next slide. So what is a pesticide? It's any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Next slide. So I wanna take a second for you to kind of think about which of these common household products are pesticides. And the slide's a little small. I don't know how big it's gonna be on your screen. But you know, this includes things like uh, Clorox bleach. We have an, a mosquito repellent here, a disinfecting wipe, uh, a bathroom cleaner, and some other things. So a fungicide, a bait, uh, wheat, turf weed and feed. So just think to yourself about this for a second. Kind of look at these products. All right, next slide. So it was a trick question, of course. <laughs> the answer is that all of them are pesticides um, because each of them is a substance that's designed to control or repel living things that are harmful to something that's important to us. And it's important to note that not all of these things need to kill the pest. So for example, this off mosquito repellent just repels mosquitoes, right? It doesn't need to kill them. Uh, and then some of these agents that you might've thought as more as cleaning agents like the Clorox or the disinfecting wipes, uh, those are still considered pesticides, right? Because on their label, they claim to uh, mitigate microbes or uh, viruses. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about pesticides in IPM. Next slide. So the definition uh, for IPM from the Northeastern IPM Center website uh, reads that IPM is a sound, sensible approach to dealing with pests, insects, plant diseases, weeds, and more, with methods that protect human health and the environment while saving money. And so regardless of what your definition is or what definition you prefer for IPM, I think we can all agree that its overarching goal is to effectively manage pests while posing the least risk to humans in the environment. 
So as pesticide safety educators, Dan and I try to help people achieve that goal. Uh, and so they, this is from our website. Our mission is to promote the safe use of pesticides to help reduce risk to applicators, consumers, and the environments. Again, it's about reducing risk to people and the environment. Next slide. So the New York State Community IPM program says start to finish, good IPM is based on seven steps. So these include prepare, prevent, monitor, analyze, manage, apply, and reevaluate. So let's look at where pesticides fit in within those steps. Next slide. For prepare, in this step, you wanna be aware of the potential problems and opportunities at your site, and you want to know your pests and keep good records. So while pesticides don't really play a role in identifying pests, proper identification is needed to select the effective management options, including pesticides. So for example, here we have two common ants in the Northeast and on the top, you're gonna to see a pavement ant on the bottom picture, it's a carpenter ant. And their biology and habits are really different, right? So it's really important to know what ant you're dealing with before you even start thinking about management. Next slide. So in this case, the proper identification of the ant will dictate which management tool you can use. For example, this Monterey insecticide label, uh, it shows that you know, this can be used to control pavement ants, but it's not for use in carpenter ants. So that's why that identification is so important. Next slide. The next step is prevent. So you wanna protect your landscape and buildings for the long term. Building codes often require pressure treated wood and in some locations, pre-construction termiticide treatments and termiticide is a pesticide, right? Uh, in addition, you know, sometimes barrier treatments can help prevent pests from establishing indoors. So that's another example where a pesticide can be part of that prevent step. Next slide. Monitor. For this step, you wanna scout your landscape and buildings to find out which pests are on your site or in your space. So pictured here is a pheromone trap that gives off a scent of more and it attracts male plum fruit moths. Pheromone traps are often used to monitor pest problems, especially stored product pests in food facilities. And pheromones are in fact pesticides, uh, but they are not regulated under FIFRA when they're used alone for the purpose of attracting and trapping pest insects. So this is an example where pesticides can be used in that monitor step. Next slide. For the analyze step, your threshold data will tell you if it's time to act. So an example of a pesticide that could be used at this step uh, are termite baiting systems. And so these prevent damage to buildings by baiting the termites, <laughs> but they also provide monitoring data, which can help you see how big that termite population is, right? And decide if you need to take further action. Next slide. Manage. So you want to choose among tactics that provide the best balance of economic, environmental costs and effectiveness while reducing risk. So although there are often numerous combinations of tactics that could effectively manage a pest, only one of those combinations can be the one that presents the least risk. And if that combination includes a pesticide, then you use it. So we'll discuss choosing between management options and risk benefit analyses later on in the talk. Next slide. Apply. When management is justified, you wanna do it right, okay? So this goes for every management option that you use, not just chemical controls, right? All management options pose some level of risk. And with pesticides, any hazards, as well as the steps needed to mitigate the risks associated with those hazards are stated right on the pesticide label. And we'll discuss the terms hazard and risk in a minute. But here you can see an example of a pesticide that is toxic to aquatic organisms. Uh, and the steps to prevent risk to those species are shown right here on the label. So for instance, the label says to protect the environment, do not allow pesticides to enter uh, storm drains or drainage ditches. Next slide. Reevaluate. So you wanna look at your results, fine tune your response and make proactive plans for next time. Using a pesticide to bring a pest under control doesn't necessarily mean that you have to continue using that pesticide, right? Or that that's warranted. So in some cases, it might be that timing's a factor. You have to do a quick knockdown of the pest population. Uh, and then that might buy you time to make other changes that take time, like structural repairs or landscape changes to better prevent uh, and manage the pest. So for example, here we have a picture of a carpenter ant satellite colony in the home. 
And you know, you obviously need to kill this colony first to prevent further damage before you do some of the time consuming steps such as sealing gaps in the house's exterior or creating a vegetation free zone around the building. Once you do those things though, you may not need a pesticide to manage the ants in the future. Next slide. All right, so I think this is where we're gonna stop for questions. Um, and then up next, Dan will be talking about pesticide registration. So any questions on what I just talked about? Yep, there are, there are a couple of them. Ooh, that's funny feedback. Um, so there's a question from Audrey. She said, um, asking about soaps and detergents that claim to kill germs, would they be co covered under FIFRA as well? Hmm. That would be a yes. If a product claims to kill germs, it needs to be registered as a pesticide. Great, lovely, thank okay, you. Thanks, Dan, yeah. Um, second question, um, does New York well, allow... Well, actually, Yana, can I clarify that? Yes. If it, if it claims to kill germs on surfaces, it's a pesticide. So like disinfectant wipes, do you wipe on doorknobs or you, you know, mm -hmm. disinfectants used to clean your toilet? Those are pesticides. But something like a hand sanitizer, which is designed to control bacteria on your skin, that's not a pesticide. That comes under... Uh, FDA, right? FDA, yeah. Yeah, it's not regulated um, nope. same way, but... Yeah, so, so antibacterial soaps are designed to protect your hands, so they are not pesticides, whereas something, a, a hand uh, wipes you use on surfaces to kill germs are pesticides. So sorry about that. Yeah, and you want to look at the product because sometimes they say, you know, the terminology can be really different. Sometimes they list the things that the product kills. And sometimes it, the product is just for cleaning. In that case, it wouldn't be a pesticide. Okay. Um, another question we have is, does New York State allow owners of rental property or dwellings um, or their maintenance staff to do pest control treatment without being certified pest control operators? Or are they supposed to hire a PCO to treat tenants, apartments, or a house? He's mostly thinking of uh, roaches or bed bugs, but of course, ants and rodents and all fall into that category. I'm going to let Dan answer this one because he's just been taking a lot of these kinds of questions recently. Yeah. Um, no, you would have to uh, either be certified yourself or hire a certified applicator. You're allowed to, if you say you live in the apartment building where the, you're the owner and you have an apartment in the building, you can treat your own apartment. But to apply pesticides in someone else's living space, you need to get certified by the state. All right, thank you. Um, and Alison Johnson asked, uh, what about sanitizing laundry detergent? Right, so that's a really good point, Alison. I think you know some folks have asked these kind of, this question before. So if the laundry detergent says that it, uh, you know, if it lists things that it claims to control, like microbes. Um, or bacteria or anything else that's a living thing, then it is a pesticide. Yeah, so there are some laundry detergents that are pesticidal. Okay, yeah, I was thinking about that too. Um, and then there's a comment here from Gary Fish before we move on. He says, I find the term chemical control to be misleading. Everything is chemical or elemental, even natural pesticides or pesticides approved for certified organic agriculture or chemicals. Should we say pesticide control or use a pesticide instead of a chemical. And maybe we'll get into that during the presentation. So um, unless you want to address that now. And that's a really good point, Gary. Yes, I, I think that uh, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but yes, everything is a chemical. <laughs> All right, great. All right, so Dan, I think you're, you're next. Okay, thank you. Um, and now that we recognize pesticides as one of the tools in the IPM toolbox, I'll take a bit to talk about pesticide product registration and risk assessment. Next slide. There are many ways to classify pesticides, but for the purposes of talking about how they fit into IPM, I think it's best to separate them into three groups based on their registration status. Now would be registered pesticides, pesticides exempt from registration, and home remedies, which are neither registered nor exempt from registration. Next. So most pesticide products must be registered by the EPA before they can be so used and sold in the United States. 
Registration involves putting them through over 100 tests for making health and environmental risk assessments. Plus, efficacy testing is required if the product is going to claim to protect against uh, human disease. And pesticides undergo registration review every 15 years to see if any safety requirements or restrictions need to be strengthened or added uh, given new scientific findings and or new use patterns. Next. And you can tell if the pest has been registered simply by looking for the EPA registration number on the label. It usually appears near the ingredient statement or near the company contact information. Next. But each state can add restrictions or deny use of an EPA registered product in order to further protect its citizens, citizens' health or the state's unique environmental resources. For example, here in New York, you can determine whether an EPA registered product uh, can be used by searching the product's name and registration number in this database. Next. So in order for a product to be registered, EPA in your state must determine that the product will not pose unreasonable risk to people in the environment when used according to label directions. That's a high standard and important one with respect to the IPM's goal of minimizing risk. So I want to take some time to look at some key terms in this standard, starting with risk. Next slide. Okay, here we go. Okay, now many people equate hazard and risk, but they're very different. Next slide. Hazard is a measure of a pesticide's ability to cause harm. It's an inherent property of the, chem of the pesticide itself. It's, it can't be changed. If a pesticide is corrosive to eyes, it will damage your eyes on contact, plain and simple. Next. Risk, on the other hand, is an estimate of how likely this pesticide will cause harm. That depends both on the hazards it presents and your exposure to it. So if you're wearing protective goggles when you handle a pesticide that's corrosive to eyes, you greatly lower your risk of eye damage without doing anything to change the chemical you're dealing with. Next. So this is what we call the risk equation. Risk equals hazard times exposure. You'll never hear me say that any chemical is safe because that implies zero risk, okay? But all chemicals pose a hazard at some level of exposure. When you talk about pesticides that people are handling or they could um, be exposed to in you know, food residues, it's hard to say there's gonna be zero exposure. So given that neither hazard nor exposure are zero, simple math says risk can't be zero either. So we always say there's some level of risk, but it can either be low or high. Okay, it can be, and that depends on, again, the hazard and our level of exposure to it. So unlike hazard, risk is mutable. We can manage it. We can reduce risk by being smart. We can also increase it by being stupid. And uh, you might wonder why I use the term hazard instead of toxicity. And that's because toxicity only refers to chemicals, whereas the concepts of hazard and risk apply much more broadly, including to non-chemical pest management options. And I'll share that example here to help people understand the difference between hazard and risk. Next slide. So you would invite a bear or a porcupine into your living room, but of the two, which poses the greater hazard? That is, which is capable of causing more harm to you? The bear, right? Next slide. Now look at these two situations. Tell me which animal poses the greater risk. That is, which is more likely to cause harm to the people you see in the photos. The zoo visitors are being smart. Okay, the concrete walls and the reinforced glass are essentially personal protective equipment. Virtually ensuring there's no exposure to the bears and therefore keeping the risk as low as possible. The person on the right, who's yours truly, by the way, uh, is being, in his wife's words, stupid. Um, I'm trying to get a close-up picture of a porcupine who's stealing some apples from my tree. It's early morning. If I were to slip on the dew or on the rotten apple or misjudge the speedless porcupine, I could be in harm's way pretty quickly. Next. So likewise, do we even need to know what these two people are spraying to have an idea of who might be at greater risk? The person on the right is wearing long sleeves, long pants, gloves, protective eyewear. Person on the left is dressed for a day on the beach. Okay, so this highlights the problem of telling people something is safe. When you say it's safe, they let their guard down. They don't take the basic precautions necessary to protect themselves. 
So in this case, even if the person on the left is applying a pesticide that's less toxic, he's gonna, he's gonna uh, probably experience greater exposure and therefore might be at more risk than the person on the right. Next. So back to the registration standard, uh, it recognizes the risk is never zero. So it says no unreasonable risk. Now, unreasonable risk might sound like an oxymoron. You know, what risk of pesticides is acceptable? But we accept risk every day if the benefit outweighs the risk. And driving a car is a great example. You often don't even think of the risks. So if you have a hankering for pizza, next slide. And it's a lovely summer day, you'll gladly hop in your car and drive a few miles into town to pick up a pizza without even thinking about the risks. Next slide. Around a winter evening when there's seven inches of fresh snow on the ground, it's still coming down hard. Suddenly that pizza isn't enough of a benefit that way the risk is it. And EPA and your state regulatory agencies take this same view and they're looking to whether or not to register specific uses of a pesticide. If the risk outweighed the benefit, they're not gonna let people use it. It just doesn't make sense. Next. The other important part of the registration standard is when used according to label directions. Next slide. The label is the information printed on or attached to the container. It contains all the information you need to use the product correctly and effectively while protecting you, others, and the environment. It will tell you of any hazards and how to minimize risk. Next. And with registered pesticides, the label is the law. It says so right in the directions for use. What that means is you can only use a pesticide as directed by the label. For example, you can only apply it to sites listed on the label. If it's only listed for outdoor use, you can't use it indoors. The results of all those health and environmental risk assessments I mentioned earlier are reflected on the label. So the rates listed are high enough to control the pest, but too low to pose an unreasonable risk. So using more pesticide than the label says to use would be an even worse decision than driving through that snowstorm for pizza because there's no benefit at the end of the road. Uh, if the label tells you that one ounce of pesticide will kill all the ants coming into your kitchen, using two ounces won't make, it, won't make them any deader, will it? All it will do is increase the risk associated using that pesticide without any added benefit. Now, sometimes EPA will determine that the only way of the use of a pesticide will meet that registration standard is if they restrict the use to people who are trained and certified. In that case, next slide, they'll classify the pesticide as restricted use and that statement will be right on the product label, right near the brand name. Now a state can choose to make a product restricted use even if the EPA doesn't. Um, for example, here in New York, any pesticide used uh, that can be applied to surface waters is restricted use, whether EPA restricted it or not. In such case, that statement won't appear on the product label, but if your state provides a database of stamped labels, they might appear there. Next. As we can see here on a, a pesticide in New York State, it's not restricted by EPA, but it's stamped restricted by New York State in that uh, label database you can find online. Next, please. So registered pesticides can be a good fit in an IPM program because the extensive risk assessments are, refl are reflected on the label directions. So we can make reasonable estimates as to whether using one will help us meet IPM's goal of least risk while we manage the pest. Next. Now some pesticide products that meet very specific regulatory requirements can be used and sold without being registered by EPA, though your state might require they are registered. These are the 25B or so-called minimum risk pesticides. Now, personally, this is my opinion, I prefer the name 25B, which refers to the paragraph in the federal regulation rather than minimum risk, because these products do not undergo EPA's testing for health and environmental risk assessments. So if you haven't done those assessments fully, it's hard to really judge if risk really is minimal. Um, many were given this designation because they are essential oils or food grade, but to me, what's important is how a pesticide is used, not where it came from. A uh, simple example is your kids might love hot sauce on their buffalo wings, but that doesn't mean you give them a can of pepper spray to play with. Okay, it's the same chemical, capsaicin, that makes peppers hot, but also does a lot of damage to your eyes if you're hit with pepper spray. 
So at one point, the active ingredients in these products had gone through the registration process, which showed little risk from their registered uses. But now that they're exempt from the process, they can be used for other uses. So something that might have been only used indoors now can be used outdoors. And we know what the risks are to bees, for example. Or maybe now it can be applied to your skin as an insect repellent. Are we fully aware of those risks? So I always tell people, if you're going to use these products, try to get some authoritative evidence that they'll do the job without posing much risk to you. Now, another thing to think about these can often be difficult to distinguish legal from illegal products. One reason is if they're not being registered, if you know database that your state has, you can't easily look up the label to find out. Next. But another reason is that there's relatively few allowable active and inner ingredients in these products, you know, for them to qualify as 25B products. And the list of those chemicals are scattered among three different um, federal regulations. So it'd be hard to be in a store and look at a label and tell, is this really legal or is someone trying to con me? Um, so just something to watch out for. You might want to check your extension uh, office to see if that's really you know, complying with their regulation as a legal product. Now, one thing about these, they, they, um, they can't make claims about protecting you from disease because they don't go through the efficacy testing the EPA registered products do. So a 25B product could say you can use it to repel mosquitoes and ticks, but it can't say you can use it to repel mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus or ticks that carry Lyme disease, okay? And the label can't include any uh, misleading claims. Next. But what's interesting, one of those claims it can include is this misuse statement that I talked about being on the label of registered products. And the reason for that is the regulation state that this statement must go on the label of registered pesticide products. So if it appears on a 25B product, it might mislead someone into thinking that it's actually a registered product that's gone through all the um, risk assessments I talked about. Now keep in mind that even though this statement can't appear on the label of a 25B product, your state might still require you to follow label directions. That's the case here in New York. You have to follow label directions whether or not this statement appears. Next. So because you know, one of the goals of IPM is to minimize risk, 25B pesticides may or may not be a good fit because it's harder to assess the risks with them. So that's why, again, you want to find uh, someone who's using a track record, some authoritative evidence that they really will meet that goal of providing least risk because that's really what we're all about with IPM, manage the pests with the least risk. Next. So about the third group of pesticides, home remedies for pest control. As I said, they're not registered and they're not exempt from registration. Uh, you'll see recipes for them online, in newspapers, and even local newscasts. And while people promoting them are often well-intentioned, they'll make claims such as chemical-free, pesticide-free, non-toxic, all-natural, effective, and safe. Whereas the reality is everything is made of chemicals, okay? And as Mary mentioned, any chemical that controls pests is by definition a pesticide. And in most cases, chemicals must be toxic to kill things. Um, I'm sorry, next slide. I forgot to tell you in advance. And next slide. Sorry, I'm bad about that. Okay. Um, another claim is all natural, whereas a lot of the recipes include man-made products such as dish soap, uh, hydrogen peroxide, or kitchen vinegar. But even all natural doesn't necessarily mean safe. Remember that capsaicin example I mentioned before. As far as effectiveness, it's largely untested and many are demonstrably unsafe. What's interesting is some of the home remedies will contain uh, active ingredients that are actually in registered pesticides. For example, hydrogen peroxide or acetic acid, which is what's in vinegar, are active ingredients in registered pesticides. The difference is with a registered pesticide, the label will tell you what the hazards are and what steps you can take to reduce risk. Home remedies, that's not there. You don't know what the hazards are, you don't know how to reduce risk. And for all these reasons, um, they're actually illegal to use here in New York State. Um, next. And next, there you go, thank you. Um, 
So home remedies don't really fit with an IPM simply because the risks are unknown. And if you're trying to minimize risk, you have to know what the risks are. Okay, if you can't quantify them, you can't minimize them. And next slide. Wonderful, thank you. We have a couple of questions. Um, Audrey asks, does New York State reevaluate products more often than the EPA does at the federal level? And if so, how often does the DEC evaluate them? Uh, I've had that question before. I really don't know the answer, but to give you an idea, when I say that they're reevaluated every 15 years, um, that doesn't mean they wait, EPA waits 15 years. That's almost a 15 year long process where they are reviewing data, they're looking at published literature, they're looking at incident data that comes in from both the registrants and also from healthcare providers. Uh, and both EPA and DC can act within that 15 year period. An example is partway through the 15 year period for reviewing neonicot neonicotinoid insecticides, EPA came out with additional label statements to help protect pollinators. Um, DC right now decided to, uh, beginning January 2023, they're going to make a lot of the neonics restricted use. So that's something that's done even before EPA, you know, is concluding their their round of review. So the, both agencies do step in as data comes in as they feel they need to do things. They don't necessarily wait a full 15 years to make any changes. All right, lovely, thank you. And there's a question here for Mary from Janice uh, Becklinger. Uh, what would be a commonly used example of an exempt pesticide? So I, I'm sorry, I didn't know how to answer these. <laughs> so I think I pressed that I would like to live answer. Uh, Dan can weigh in too, but here in the chat, I put some information from the EPA on minimum risk pesticides. Um, and to answer Janice's question, you know, it, it kind of depends on the product, but it is done by active ingredients. So I gave you the list that the EPA has of minimum risk active ingredients. And some of those include things like citric acid. Uh, there's some vinegars that contain acetic acid that can be considered minimum risk. Uh, anything else you wanted to add, Dan? Yeah, it's hard to come up with a common example because we don't have a database of them. Um, and I've been in stores before looking at some that I can tell really aren't 25B. So I see some but it's not just the active ingredients, even the inert ingredients have to be cleared and they have to be stated on the label. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly couldn't give you a, a common example because we just simply don't have a database of them. All right, thank you. And for, uh, for folks who came in after my opening spiel, if you have questions, if you can put them in the Q&A, um, that will help me to monitor them and uh, ask them at the appropriate time. And uh, just so people are aware with scheduling, we'll probably be complete about um, 15 minutes past the hour. Um, and this is a, will go a little bit longer depending on how many questions we have. All right, so next, uh, Mary's going to talk to us um, about uh, the benefits of, uh, of pesticides. Okay, thank you so much, Yana. And I just wanted to point out that uh, in the chat, we have someone from the EPA <laughs> that gave us more information on those minimum risks. So please read that. Um, all right, so we know that registered pesticides can pose known risks to people in the environment, but if we use them according to label directions within an IPM program, you know, we talked about how the benefits should outweigh the risks, right? And so it might be kind of odd to be talking about the benefits of pesticides because we're often discussing the risks, but it's important uh, for us to think about the benefits because that really helps us evaluate whether a pesticide is useful. Next slide. So some of the benefits of pesticides uh, include things like clearing roadways, all right? So you can see here the sign is hard to read. Um, and so herbicides can clear right-of-ways effectively using minimal manpower and rendering the roadways safer. Uh, next. A person bitten by a mosquito carrying West Nile virus may die. And so insecticides used as part of a public health plan can reduce that adult mosquito population to levels that minimize transmission risk. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> We've got a phone in the background here. Hope it's not too loud. Um, so these pictures 
Deer show corn rootworm damage, which leads to significant economic loss for farmers, and it also reduces our food supply. As part of an IPM program, pesticides can help protect corn roots sufficiently for the plants to yield well. And you can see in this picture that you know, the corn is actually falling over. So along with a bunch of other management options, you know, pesticides can be an important tool to help with this pest. Next slide. So now that we talked about the benefits of pesticide and Dan gave you, you know, a really good introduction to how to find those uh, on the label. Uh, we wanna talk about doing a risk benefit analysis with all your management methods to decide which tools are warranted for your pest situation. Next slide. So conducting a risk benefit analysis is part of IPM. And of course, one of those important steps is to identify the pests and evaluate the pest pressure. Uh, so one thing I do wanna say is, you, know, you may be able to tolerate a harmless pest or those that are not causing significant damage. In that case, if the pest is not causing significant damage, implementing any control method would not outweigh, um, you know, the risk of that would not outweigh the benefits, right? Because there are no benefits to controlling something that is not causing significant damage. If a management tool is warranted, then you want to know all of the management tools that are in your toolbox. And so, you know, you would talk to the wonderful IPM experts that are here, including those from the Northeastern IPM Center, um, about management options. And if a management tactic is warranted, then you would do this risk-benefit analysis. Next slide. So what do I mean by risk-benefit analysis? Well, here's an example. Let's say that you have an active wasp nest above your front door, and imagine it's summer and not <laughs> this like hanging on spring winter thing we're going through. Um, so this wasp nest is there. The benefit to managing this pest is pretty obvious, right? Effectively managing the wasp nest will reduce your risk of getting stung. Next slide. So you could use an insecticide like Hotshot to manage the wasps. This particular product is inherently toxic to insects, which is not unexpected, right? Because it kills wasps. Um, the label also warns it's toxic to fish and can be toxic to you if swallowed or absorbed through the skin. So what you need to do is assess the risk these hazards pose based on the expected level of exposure. For example, the label explicitly states not to stand below or downwind of the nest when applying and not to apply the product directly to water and to only apply it to the nest, right? So this should limit exposure to you and to aquatic life and other insects. So the risk could be minimized. Does the level of risk, uh, if you're following the label, outweigh the benefit of removing the nest? Well, I still can't answer that question for you, okay? Because this really depends on your unique situation. You know, how high up is the nest in the eaves? Is it close to the door mechanism? or way up there? Is it near a porch where you eat regularly? Are you or someone else in your household allergic to wasps? You know, all of those factors are going to change uh, and affect your risk benefit analysis. Next slide. Perhaps you're thinking, wait, I could deal with this uh, without using a pesticide. I can just knock this nest down with a stick. And yes, that is another option, uh, but it's important to understand that all management options come with hazards and can pose risks. So the hazards of mechanically displacing the nest are that the displaced wasps could sting you um, and they could potentially go on to build another nest on your property. So if management is warranted, you really have to weigh the risk between all of the options. So what is the least risk option here between knocking down the nest mechanically or uh, using this pesticide? Once again, this depends on a lot of different factors. All right, so how large is your nest? How easy would it be to knock down? How close do you have to get to the nest using both of these different control methods? You know, what species and life stage of wasps are you dealing with? Is there a chance that the displaced wasps will re-nest? Well, you don't really know that unless you know what time of year it is and what species you're dealing with, right? Uh, so those are a lot of different things that, you know, just the list of some of the things you need to look into. Next slide. And I would be remiss to not say hey, that you can also call a pest control professional. Um, and this person, you know, is trained to deal with wasps, so it's pretty likely that you're going to effectively manage that pest uh, with very minimal risk to you because you are actually not doing the management in that case, the pest control professional is. Uh, of course, you know, this would cost more, so you just need to weigh all, all of the management options in your toolbox before uh, deciding which is the least risk. Next slide. So another example, I talked about uh, using herbicides to control weeds on the roadsides and to clear signs. Um, 
And, you know, I think it, it's pretty easy to think about okay, what could be the risk associated with an herbicide uh, on the roadside, right? And some of these could include, or some of the hazards, I mean, could include, um, you know, toxicity to target plants and wildlife, hazards to the humans applying it. Maybe there's a potential for drift off site. Remember, the risks associated with these hazards can be minimized if you're following label precautions and directions. Um, but you know, there's still concern there, and some people are, who are concerned about these hazards associated with herbicides often advocate for the use of string trimmers um, and mechanical management of weeds along highway guardrails. But I just want to think about you know, what uh, risks come with that management method, because remember, every management method has its own set of hazards and risks. So next slide. So using string trimmers along highway guardrails, some of the hazards include, uh, it's allowed, this can lead to hearing loss. Um, the vibrations can also lead to nerve damage. There's whipping action with the string trimmers. Uh, this can throw rocks at workers and vehicles. If you wanna think about with the trimmer, you know, there's engine exhaust, right? So this is a possible human carcinogen and it's also uh, cont cont contaminate the environment. And then think about the changes that might happen to traffic. Right, so you have more of these uh, staff on the shoulder. Uh, so their risk of being struck by a vehicle goes up and also vehicular accidents are more likely when there's work zones, right? And trimmers take more time. Uh, and then lastly, you know, you wouldn't think about throwing plastic on the side of the road. I think everyone here is uh, interested in conservation, you know, wouldn't do something like that. But with string trimmers, that's exactly what happens. In micro pieces, that plastic string trimmer ends up on the side of the guardrail, right? So you do get that pollution. And all of these things, uh, all these concerns are exacerbated by the fact that trimming takes longer and must be repeated more often because it does not kill the underground portions of perennial weeds. So as a result, uh, DOT officials have told us that worker safety is one of the main reasons they have an herbicide program. All right, so uh, next slide, and I think Dan will be taking it from here, talking about how to select a pesticide product. Hey, thanks, Mary. Um, okay, so we know that pesticides can fit into an IPM program, but only if you select the right pesticide. It's very easy to come home with the wrong product. Uh, when I talk to master gardener volunteers and extension educators who help people solve their, their pest management problems, I tell them, even if you're going to recommend a specific pesticide product, you also need to teach people how to select a pesticide product. Okay, it's not enough to say, go use this. And why is that? Very simple. Um, pesticide products are not universally available. Uh, there might be some products you can get at your hardware store, I can't get at mine. Okay, so what happens if you tell someone to use product X, they go into a hardware store and it's not there. Next slide. This is what they're faced with. And now they have to try to figure out which one of these might work, okay? And if they were good at that, they wouldn't have called you in the first place or called the extension educator in the first place. Um, and if they're at the store at night or on weekends when most people that are shopping, they're, they're probably not gonna get a hold of the person they first talked to. And a lot of them are gonna turn to the nice person in the store who you know might be a nice high school kid working a summer job whose knowledge of pesticides stops at the blue jugs go next to the orange boxes on this shelf. And I, honestly, I've been in a lot of hardware stores and big box stores, and I've hardly met anyone who has any knowledge of pesticides. Sometimes I just field test them, and they just don't know. They're not as knowledgeable as extension educators, master gardener volunteers, IPM specialists. So we want to teach people how to select a pesticide product so if they don't find one that's recommended, they can find an alternative that will work. Next. And it's really not that hard to do. Basically, all you have to do is teach them how to read a pesticide label. Next. And the first step is simply look at the label. And if you can answer yes to each of the following seven questions, it's okay to buy the product. It will do the job. Next, first question is simply, is the target pest on the label for the intended site of application? So if you're like me, you might have Japanese beetles attacking your rhubarb every spring. Uh, and you might wanna go out and get something to control them. So this product says it'll control Japanese beetle adults, might even have a nice picture of the beetle on the front label. Next, 
but it's just for use on lawns. Okay, so that means you can't apply it to vegetables. Um, products used on food plants are held to additional safety standards that this product wouldn't be. So vegetables treated with it might not be safe to eat. Next. Second question is, will it control the right life stage of the pest? So a lot of those BT products out there are fantastic for controlling 10 caterpillars that are attacking your crab apple or apple trees. Next. But only if you apply them soon after the eggs hatch. Once the caterpillars get larger, which unfortunately is when most people notice them, uh, that insecticide is not going to do a very good job of controlling them anymore. So you might apply it, but you're not really going to get the benefit you want. Next. Can you apply the pesticide when you need it? Here's some statements off a fungicide used for home vegetable gardens. It says, don't spray plants during extremely hot or sunny weather because that could cause phytotoxicity, could damage the plant. Um, so if you're in the mid middle of an August heat wave, you'll have to look for something else. Also, a lot of products used on home vegetables and fruits will have a pre-harvest interval or PHI. That's the number of days you have to wait after the last application before you can harvest the plants. And here it's seven days. And the reason for that is to allow enough time for pesticide residues to break down so it will be okay to eat the vegetable or fruit. That's one of those additional safety standards I mentioned earlier. Next. Are you willing and able to abide by all application restrictions? Now here's some restrictions on a product that's used indoors for flea control. It's pretty basic, you know, remove pets, get people out of the area, don't let them back in until sprays have dried. Pretty simple stuff. But if you're looking at a product that says maybe, you know, don't re-enter the treated area for four hours, that might pose some problems. You might look for something else. Next. Do they have or will they buy the necessary application and personal protective equipment? Let's say someone uh, wants to buy a, a liquid concentrate. They're going to have to mix. Uh, they're going to have to dilute it before they spray it. Well, they're going to need to buy a measuring cup. The reason I say they have to buy a measuring cup, we all have one, right? But no, you want to buy a separate one next and label it with the word pesticides to make sure you never use it in the kitchen, okay? So I'll have to buy a separate measuring cup. They'll need to buy a sprayer. And whatever pesticide they decide to use, if the label says to wear, say, waterproof gloves or protective eyewear, they have to. That's not an option. Again, you have to follow label directions. So if it says to wear gloves, you have to buy them. Next. Is the product practical to use? This is pretty simple. Okay, this little pump bottle of uh, herbicide could work great on dandelions and sidewalk and patio cracks. Next. But it's clearly not the, uh, the product of choice for this situation, if that's what you're trying to control. Next. And we've all been uh, stacking up on disinfectant wipes the last couple of years because of COVID. And I hope people have taken the time to actually read the label and see the quick wipe of a doorknob is not gonna kill a virus. The surface has to remain wet for a certain amount of time. Now here we have two statements from different labels. The one on the top says that the surface has to remain wet for 10 minutes. The one on the bottom says it has to be, stay wet for four minutes. Um, all things being, all other things being equal, the one on the bottom might be more practical. It still might take more than one wipe to ensure that stays wet for long enough, but it's still more practical than waiting, you know, to wait just four minutes rather than 10. Next slide. And finally, question seven, did you read the entire label? This is very important because all these things I've mentioned are scattered throughout the label. You want to look at the whole thing. And there's a lot of information. So more and more products won't have all the information printed on the container itself. At the back of the container, there'll be a little clear plastic packet that you have to peel back to unfold the label and read it. And I always tell people, go ahead and do that in the store. Okay, it's easy to fold the label back up and seal it back up. Okay, do it in the store. You have to read the whole label before you decide to buy a product. And one of the main reasons for this is branding. Okay, um, I love special case cereal, but my wife came home with the wrong one one time because uh, there are now many different, entirely different cereals that go under the brand name of Special K. Uh, next slide, please. And pesticide companies do the same thing with branding. For example, we have the original Roundup. 
that has glyphosate, herbicide adaptive ingredient, which will kill any plant you spray, but has almost no resid residual activity. So the label directions say you can use it to prep a vegetable garden, to get rid of the weeds in the garden, and then plant just a few days later. Please read the label. It's a few days, but I'm not going to say how many, so I don't remember offhand. Whereas, next slide, Roundup Easy Mix adds another active ingredient that does have residual activity. So this one you can't use to prep a vegetable garden and then plant in the next couple of days. Next slide. Now there's Roundup Landscape Weed Preventer. It doesn't have glyphosate in it at all. It has selective herbicides that you can apply around certain ornamental plants to kill the weeds, but not those lovely plants in the ornamental bed. If you pick one of these other two Roundup products by mistake without reading the full label, you're gonna be very unhappy with the results because all your ornamental plants will be dead. Next, and now there's even Roundup Bug Destroyer, okay? It's an insecticide, not an herbicide at all. Next, another common example is all the different mosquito repellents that have off in the brand name. They can have different active ingredients, work for different length of times, and even have different application restrictions. For example, next slide. While all of these can be used on children, only of the ones shown here, only off botanicals cannot be used on children under three years of age. Now that's something you might not expect with a product that has botanicals in the name, but just another reminder, natural does not mean safer. And I also have to say, I said they can all be used on children, but they will all, all the labels say that an adult applies it to children. Don't give a can of repellent to a kid and say, spray yourself. Label says you can't do that. Next. So if you find a product you answer yes to all those seven questions, you're good to go. But there might be something about it you don't like. For example, maybe it is a concentrate and you'd rather get ready to use. Um, so if you have a couple of products to choose from, here's some things to consider to you know, decide which one might best suit your personal needs. Next. You may well consider which one has an EPA registration number. Again, registered pesticides have gone through that litany of health and environmental risk assessments. Hazards are stated on the label as well as steps to mitigate risk. Whereas the 25B product hasn't gone through all that. Next. You want to consider one which poses less risk. Now, I, I did say that all registered pesticides meet the standard of posing no unreasonable risk when used according to label directions. But accidents can happen, right? So you want to think, okay, if something goes wrong, which one might cause, is more likely to cause harm? Also, what risks you consider important will vary depending on your situation. Um, for example, if the label says it's toxic to aquatic invertebrates, that might not be so important to you if you live in a landlocked neighborhood level land. Whereas if you have lakefront property or a backyard pond, that might matter more. Next. So remember the risk equation, risk equals hazard times exposure. And again, toxicity is one form of hazard. So what this means is least toxic does not necessarily mean least risk. We're trying to minimize risk, okay? Toxicity, one thing to consider. You also have to consider exposure. Next please. So toxicity, especially for registered pesticides, is pretty easy to assess. Um, there'll be signal words on the front of the label. Oops. Um, danger means it's highly toxic or can be corrosive to eyes and skin. Warning is moderately toxic. Caution means it's slightly toxic. And if there's no signal word, that means it's relatively non-toxic. Next. And there'll be a statement about hazard to humans and domestic animals, which will talk about specific routes of exposure that might be concerned. For example, here it says causes moderate eye irritation. Next. And then you want to consider exposure. For example, a ready-to-use spray might pose less exposure than a liquid concentrate for two reasons. One, the concentrate, you have to mix it. There's a chance for splashes. You might get some on your skin. And if you do get some on your skin, it's concentrated, more concentrate chemical to get into your skin versus a dilute product. Next, a bait or a crack and crevice spray will result in less exposure than something that's applied to exposed surfaces. Think of using uh, ant bait stations. You can tuck behind a refrigerator or up on the counter behind the toaster where your kids can't reach it. 
versus using an aerosol spray that you're spraying along the baseboards where kids are crawling. Next. How many applications does it need to get the job done? One or two? Less risk of exposure than something that needs frequent reapplication. So in each of these cases, uh, the product on the left, you know, that might, again, ready to use a, a bait or a, you know, fewer applications, might actually be more toxic than the ones on the right, but if the exposure is much less, your risk could be much less. So again, we're thinking about risk, not just toxicity. Next. And then obviously, follow, if you follow label directions, there will be less exposure because you're applying only as much as you need, not more. You're applying it only where it's supposed to go. And you're wearing the necessary personal protective equipment to protect you. And you're keeping people out of the treated area for the specified amount of time in order to protect them. Next slide, please. Likewise, you want to consider risk to the environment. I mentioned, you know, like aquatic organisms. Uh, I gave that example before. If there are any particular hazards, they will be stated on the label of registered pesticides. Next. And if those hazards do exist, the label will also tell you how to avoid them. I might actually tell you, you can't do this. You know, you know, do not apply in your body's water, not even just directly to our, not even near them. Okay. Next. You want to consider which one works for the necessary length of time. This is especially important with uh, mosquito and tick repellents. Some only work for two hours, which would be fine if you're, you know, only going to be out for a short time. But if you're going for a long hike, you might want to look for something that works for a longer period of time. Next. Consider which one is available in a reasonable amount. Next. So these two products are basically the same pesticide, except the one on the left is a concentrate. The one on the right is already diluted for you. It's ready to use. So you might think, well, concentrate is only one quart. It's only ten dollars. I'll go with that. But if your goal is to spot treat dandelions, notice the concentrate can be used. It'll cover sixteen thousand square feet. That's a third of an acre. That's a lot of spot treating dandelions. If you buy that product, odds are it's going to be on your shelf for a long time. It'll probably go bad before you use it all, or there's a greater chance you know the container is going to rupture over time. You'll have a spill, you have to pay to dispose of it. So in this case, the ready to use spring for the extra seven bucks. Next. And a quick note about buying pesticides online. Um, even if you decide, you know, okay, I know which one I want to use. If you're going to buy online, make sure they show you the product label to make sure it's exactly what you want. And it's especially important to look for an EPA registration number when buying online because online retailers have been found to sell illegal and harmful uh, pesticide products, either because they didn't know how to check or didn't bother to. And also consider your own state's restrictions. Here in New York, for example, a lot of products that can be used in most of the state can't be used on Long Island because Long Island is a sandbar, essentially, very sandy soil. The, the water table is about two feet down. Um, almost anything you put on the surface is going to get in the groundwater. So you, can, you might be living on Long Island and go to Amazon and buy a product that you're not allowed to use on Long Island, but if Amazon doesn't know that, they'll ship it to you. And then you're putting you know, your groundwater at risk without even knowing it. So in New York, you could search this database to make sure, you know, can I use that product on Long Island or not? Uh, next. I think that's what I have here. I've got here some links uh, to our website, some fact sheets that address a lot of things that Mary and I have been talking about today. And Thank you. Jana, will you be able to share those with the audience via email or something? Uh, you mean the ones that were in the chat or the ones that are here in the presentation? Oh, just these links here. I'm not sure if they're gonna be able to copy them. I, I can also put yeah, them in. Yeah, I was gonna say, okay. we can, we, when we put up the, the, um, uh, the recording, we can, we can put links to them, so for sure. And the, and the, and the slides will be up on the website too, so. Great, and I have one corollary question, which is a good one. Um, Deb Grantham said, since you brought up the degradation of large quantities that aren't used quickly, can you touch on proper disposal uh, of pesticides? Yeah, um, it sounds funny, but the best way of disposing of a pesticide is to use it according to label directions, um, quite honestly, because 
Again, all the risk assessments have been done. So if you use it according to label directions, it should pose no unreasonable risk to the environment. Um, so that's why we tell people only buy what you need. Okay, if something's on sale, don't buy four gallons. <laughs> you know, if you only need one gallon to get the job done. Um, so that's the first thing. Only buy what you need. So you, you don't run into the situation where you have to dispose of things. If you do have leftover product, um, contact your county uh, hazardous waste office or solid waste office and ask when's the next time they're running a collection drive. Um, I've done that myself. It was funny, when, my, when we moved my dad a few years ago, he has some pesticides in his basement that, uh, well, they were interesting. Uh, they didn't even have an EPA registration. Yeah, I moved them in the early 2000s. There were some products down there that didn't have an EPA registration number, which meant they were at least from the 1960s. Um, so you, know, you contact your, your county solid waste office and they will tell you when the next time they'll be running a drive where you can bring things in and give it to them and they'll dispose of them properly. So those are the two best options. Buy only what you need and use it or contact your county office. And I would add to what Dan says. I mean, we have a whole talk on how to store pesticides safely. But, uh, you know, keep in mind, you want to keep pesticides in secondary containment. So you want to put that pesticide in another container. Because if the container were to rupture, uh, you know, that second container would contain the leak and you wouldn't have it everywhere. Um, and we talk a lot about ventilation. You don't want fumes to build up. And you don't want to store pesticides near food um, or things like fertilizer, because actually it can contaminate the fertilizer. And then all of a sudden you're using, you know, fertilizer laced with pesticide in a, in a place where it shouldn't be, right? Um, and just make sure that where they're stored, you know, they're not going to uh, get extreme heat or cold too, because uh, these products can freeze. And the label usually says more about that. Yeah, don't keep them in your garage. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Mary. Great, thank you. And Shalene asked if the links in the chat will be included in the materials uh, on the website. Yes, they will. And uh, Gary Fish said in Maine, the Maine Board of Pesticides Control helps homeowners to, uh, dispose of obsolete pesticides, usually for no fee. So for folks on here from Maine, there's, a, there's that answer. So uh, great. I think those are all the questions that uh, that we had. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. And um, if we can just forward to the next slide. Uh, next one. There we go. Great. So we have some poll questions for you again. Um, and uh, just be quiet for a couple of minutes so I can ask people to answer those. I say, same as the beginning, no right or wrong answer, but it just helps us to gauge uh, the presentation today. All right, I will share the results with you. Um, so as we now know, wasp, hornet spray, weed killer, and disinfectants um, are all uh, pesticides. And um, in implementing an IPM plan, pesticides can be useful in several steps of the plan, I presume is correct. And the likelihood that a pesticide will cause harm is called risk. Um, and uh, the best way to determine which pesticide to use is to read the labels as we just found out. And I presumably you could also speak to an extension person as well. Um, oh, sorry, and, Anna, sorry to interrupt you, but just to clarify, I mean, we, you know, speaking to an extension uh, person is wonderful, right? Because they can give you that specific product recommendation. I think what we're speaking to here is that, you know, the best way to determine among different pesticides and to, to have that knowledge to do so in the future, um, and, and go to an actual store like Dan talked about, you're going to want to be uh, reading the labels to do that. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, great. So yes, unless you have a, a person from co extension with you in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the store, then uh, reading the labels. Um, and um, we have uh, over 80% of people said that they're more likely to increase their use of um, um, IPM uh, after this webinar. So thank you very much. All right, so next slide, please. Yana, can I mention one thing quickly? Sure. Um, you know, Gary brought up the, in Maine, the, their Department of Ag, I believe it is, uh, helps homeowners dispose of products. Here in New York, the DEC does run clean sweeps, but that's for 
uh, agricultural and commercial pesticide users. They don't do it for homeowners. And so um, if you're a homeowner, you contact your county office. If you're an ag producer, you could also check with the DC to see if, they're, uh, if there's clean sweeps in your area. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, so I wanted to mention here that we have a Find a Colleague site. So if you wanted to uh, contact other folks who are interested in uh, pesticides in IBM, this would be a great place to post your profile so that's what you're looking for. And um, also to look at people with similar interests. So this is our way of um, engendering um, collaboration across the Northeast since we cover the entire Northeast um, uh, region. Next slide, please. Our recording of today's webinar is going to be available on our website uh, next week. And I'll also send an email to everybody who's registered. So watch for that coming into your um, inbox sometime, probably about a week from now, because uh, it gets edited between now and then and gives us a chance to put up the links. And next slide, please. We have uh, two more toolbox webinars coming up, uh, one on combating slugs as pests of soybeans and corn and um, on April 6th and on May 4th, uh, taking a closer look how strawberry disease risk varies with microclimates at the canopy level. And you can register for both of those on our website. Um, we've also been having several uh, toolboxes and a research update conference uh, in the last few weeks, and the recordings of those are available on our website. We had a particularly interesting one, uh, I think, last week on uh, tarping that uh, you may be interested in. Uh, next slide, please. We want to acknowledge that uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional ho homelands of the Gaihono, Na uh, Cayuga Nation. Uh, they're members of the Hodon, <laughs> Hodon, Hodon, I've been practicing this all week. <laughs> I have stage nerves, uh, Haudenosaunee <laughs> Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. I really do apologize. I've been practicing every day. Uh, the Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. And we acknowledge the painful history and dispossession and honor the ongoing connection with the people past and present to these lands and waters. And uh, this uh, acknowledgement has been reviewed and uh, approved by the traditional uh, Gaihono uh, leadership. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are funded uh, through uh, NIFR, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, Crop Protection and Pest Management uh, Regional Coordination Program. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate uh, their funding for our work. And we are deeply appreciative to uh, Dan and Mary for their wisdom, their knowledge, their candor, their excellent presentation skills, and uh, the several decades that have gone into being able to put this presentation together and do it so beautifully. So thank you for all of the late nights uh, studying, all of the hard work and everything that's gone into making this possible. So I think that is the last slide. We want to see if there is another, I think not. And uh, with that, I will say thank you very, very much. And, um, and if people have follow-up uh, questions or comments, please uh, send them to us. I know there's been lots of uh, feedback on the chat with people uh, being grateful for, uh, for the wisdom that's been shared today. So thank you, Mary and Dan. Thank you, Jan, it was a pleasure. All right, bye-bye.